Welcome everybody to Radicalized, where truth survives, and we have your back. We are on episode 61. Uh, it seems to be the week of celebrating women filmmakers, and we are, last week we celebrated Melissa Jo Peltier's incredible film, The Game Is Up, and this week we are celebrating uh, filmmaker Jen Sanko's film, The Brainwashing of My Dad, OMG, we have an incredible episode coming up. Um, obviously, uh, not obviously, but I'm Heidi Kuda. I'm here with Jim Stewartson and High Fidelity. Uh, you know, we are an investigative show about disinformation and uh, the film that we are going to encourage you all to watch and the film that you're going to see clips of, The Brainwashing of My Dad, shows a woman who's kind of went on a journey to understand what happened to her very beautiful, liberal, never had an unkind word to say father who became radicalized uh, by watching Fox News and by listening to Rush Limbaugh. And we're also gonna talk about the op that her mother ran uh, against her father, where he removed those cancers from his life. And guess what happened? A beautiful, loving, kind, and liberal man returned before the end of his life. So what a story, OMG. Mom's running ops, that's <laughs> nice. What's really great yeah. is her her beautiful mother is 102, so uh, so it's incredible. But what I'm so grateful I'd for watch her. I bet she's still running ups. <laughs> uh, what I really love is that her they took their father from radicalized uh, ditto head back to who he really was at his core. And uh, I'll be sharing a personal story on why it took me seven years to watch the film. Um, until I met Jen and she told me it had a happy ending, I was unable to watch it because uh, she told my story too. My story, unfortunately, didn't have a happy ending. Um, but I am very grateful that through her film, she's heard from thousands of people and she's able to help people, uh, you know, understand what's happening to their loved ones and what can be done about it. So, yes, revisiting her film this week is very, very important because this is the week that it was revealed that Fox anchors and execs allegedly knew they were promoting a big lie, and we're going to be talking about that. So, We need as many examples of people who've, um, you know, returned from this very dark place that they've been involuntarily sent. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we have to start um, really grappling with the fact that there are people inside there that are being traumatized by this poison, this propaganda, this hate, and it changes them. It changes literally who they are into what somebody else wants. And that's the important part. This is not voluntary. Right. You know, getting addicted to Fox News and hate is something that they psychologically designed. It's a trap. Right. right. And we're going to be talking about the. this is part of a 40-year plan and how we can excise some of this from, uh, you know, the, the, the narrative. All right, gentlemen, um, let us jump into Front Loaded. Front Loaded. So what I'd like to start our show with is giving a loving shout out to President Jimmy Carter, a very good and kind man who was a very good and kind president. As we learned uh, over the weekend, he is currently in hospice care. So I decided to pull up an old tweet of mine where Jimmy Carter said, and I quote, I think a full investigation would show that Trump didn't actually win the election of 2016. He lost the election and he was put into office because the Russians interfered on his behalf. That is a quote from the great president, Jimmy Carter. Well, that God is also. <laughs> I don't know if I've heard that one. That's, oh, yeah. That is, oh, yeah. That, oh, yeah. That is pretty straight fucking up. Listen, yeah. I mean, uh, hold on. I want to pause here. The fucking ex-president of the United States said what we're telling you, the fucking Russians stole the 2016 election. Thank mm -hmm. you, Jimmy Carter. You know, I always loved you. Me too. I grew up uh, I when, when he was president, and I always loved him. I just, I just got to say, you know, Jimmy Carter is a, a good old boy from Georgia, and uh, my best friend in the world is a good old boy from Georgia, and uh, yeah, 
they they tell it like it is and yeah. and, and and guess what he did he gave up his peanut farm because he didn't want to mm-hmm. have any uh p- problem with um conflict of interest at all mm-hmm. <laughs> right that. and what- Contrast that with the monster that the Russians put in office who kept his entire Russian money laundering operation in place while he was in there. Yeah. That's that's the difference between a a sociopath and a person with empathy, which is the kind of person we need in the goddamn White House. I don't believe that people realize that when Jimmy Carter's presidency ended, he went back to essentially a bankrupt peanut farm because he so did not want that conflict of interest that Jim referred to, that he literally did the blind trust and he had to rebuild everything in his life from scratch. And I just want our viewers to pause for just another moment and reflect on the fact that four years ago, a president said that Russia interfered on behalf of our election and that a full investigation would reveal that Trump was not legitimately elected. So just one more moment. Um, he yeah. has, he he's, he's in his very deep into his nineties. And so I often have, uh, you know, heard that he might be ailing or in the hospital. So periodically I would send a lot of thoughts, you know, prayers, all those good things to this beautiful man. And this portrait I wanted to show you is from my friend, James Silk. And I just think it really embodies his beautiful mm-hmm. spirit. And so I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to show that periodically, I think that tweet's probably from four years ago. Um, all right. So in breaking Fox news, moving on to something not as pleasant as Jimmy Carter, I wrote a, a report based on the uh, Dominion voting systems lawsuit, part of its defamation lawsuit against Fox news and Fox corporation uh, that Fox is a shithole country. And the reason I wrote that is because I wanted to view them as a mass that we could actually excise and cut out of our country, much in the same way we got rid of RT. We need to do the same with Fox. And uh, so that is from my uh, Betty Dangerous Substack. If you're not a subscriber, you can listen to the podcast version of that for free. And same goes for the next column I want to reference, The Fascists Have No Clothes. The reason I'm bringing that up is because we are going to be seeing more and more of these big, ugly Republicans that the media is going to refer to as hard right extremists. They are not. They are fascists. They are they are uh, they are a form of cancer in our body politic as well. And it's very, very important that we see all of their signaling for what it is straight out of the fascist playbook. So we can be aware and we can call this stuff what it is. Um, and that is uh, that those are two stories that I wanted to bring up today. Do you guys have anything to say before we move on? Once you learn to see the ops, they become so very, very obvious. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, that yeah. story as well is available podcast version um, for anyone who's just a free member. Next, I want to go on to something very important. This is Carol speaking Cad- of ops. <laughs> this is Carol Cadwallader, Ca- Carol Cadwallader, the great investigative reporter out of the UK. Her latest investigation about the U.S. advisor who tried to swing Nigeria's election. Our viewers will recognize these players: players like Sam Patton, Brittany Kaiser, Alexander Nix. A lot of the people that we talk about when we reflect on Cambridge Analytica and its role in. Uh, you know, weaponizing uh, information uh, and uh, harming the minds of millions. Um, The reason I brought that story up is her tweet, if you want to bring that up again, one more second, high five. Mm -hmm. When she introed the story, she wrote, there's a tale and a half behind this story, but for now, I'm dedicating this to all the tech bros who told me, still tell me, that Cambridge Analytica was snake oil. Snake oil hacking black ops, a Russian spy. Thank you, Carol, who never, ever uh, diminished uh, the importance of, uh, you know, never actually dialing down uh, the harms that these people and these companies um, have perpetuated and continue to perpetuate. 
which quickly brings me to my next story. And then I want you guys to chime in. Uh, I wanted to spotlight Business Insider's latest expose on Wagner's troll operation out of Mexico, Pergozin's troll operation out of Mexico. It's very important to note that none of this was ever snake oil. It was all designed to interfere with our understanding of truth and to create this overall malaise that leads to despair and dysfunction. Um, so that's my front loaded. Yeah, this uh, story was really, uh, in my opinion, was really good. Um, it, it's important to remember that this story, for example, is only talked about a very small part of his operation, but it shows extremely clearly how it works. They target a country, Mexico, um, they set up an operation there to, um, you know, hire gig workers. Uh, they reach out to them, uh, you know, using various means on social media. They bring them in. They pay them good money compared to what, you know, they would otherwise get um, in Mexico to spread um, two different kinds of messages. One kind of message is really important and something I'm going to talk about and in hellscape it's a false uh, virtue signal right it's embedding yourself on the opponent's side by pretending to be who uh with them building clout building friendships building bonds with people inside of a movement so that when it's time when you're ready when you have a target you can go after them yeah, um, and that's what he's what he was building with these uh, gig workers in Mexico. Again, a relatively small corner of his operation, but she does this in so many countries all right. over the world. Right. Um, and and it's it's really important to kind of get a look at it, and see the concrete steps that are taken um, that get you to inauthentic actors. Um, on social media. It's very important for those who don't know that Pergozin was indicted by the Department of Justice for the troll operation that had the impacts on the 2016 election. That was the Internet Research Agency out of St. Petersburg. Yes. So they, I mean, they, uh, similar to J6, they indicted a bunch of, you know, GRU military people who are never going to be extradited. Right. Like what I'm more interested in is who were they working with in the United States? Because the actual Russians, the Russians doing the bots is a tiny percentage of what the influence was. The I influence remember. was on Americans. Yes. And, and also the IRA troll accounts were retweeted by all of the Trump campaign uh members, the Mike Flynn's of the world. Remember, remember 10 GOP, that fake t Tennessee GOP? That was mm -hmm. tweeted by uh, Don Donald Trump Jr. to his millions of followers. And that's mm -hmm. just like one small example. And of course, there was a follow-up indictment, uh, Project Lotka, which also had the same impact when they were going after our 2018 midterms. So again, talking about the bigger picture, the zoom out, this is this is uh, truth being hammered continually and the way we understand the world being manipulated continually. But, Jim, you said something very important when you said how this was clout building. I when I was a member of the real resistance in 2016, I now can see the accounts that were created in 2016 to make it look like they were part of the resistance, the fallback resistance. They were just building up their membership to detonate uh, malinformation and parasitizing campaigns later and to go after and harm people. High five. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's very obvious that, that they were they were infiltrating groups. Again, they were using internet raid culture, which you know Jim and I talked about uh, on his podcast. And the tactics, the tactics these operatives engage in, uh, they go into a group, they cause harm, they cause chaos, they cause drama. And that actually leads me to our word phrase of the week because our word phrase of the week this week, is going to be DARVO. What is DARVO, you may ask? Well, DARVO stands for Deny, Attack, and Reverse Victim and Offender. Yeah. And uh, you will see this in operations constantly. 
all I mean right. literally every single thing that that you know the at least when you get into this sort of cult phase like the GOP all of it is Darbo right okay. every single thing you see it, you know when you're attacking an 80 year old medical hero uh, you know Dr. Fauci right what is that that's Darbo you're you are flipping you know um, the the person who is being attacked who is having death threats against him um, you know for the offender as if he's some sort of you know puppet master that you know uh, engineered the deaths of millions of people um or like you know when people attack say uh hi-fi as some sort of you know evil fucking troll when all they do all day long the person people who say that are trolls that's all they do right so they're 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 denying them what they're doing they're attacking another person and they're reversing who's being attacked and when and yeah. and you know i am i am really fucking tired of this ancient trick working on people mm -hmm. um, and i'm going to be doing some exposing of not only the process of it but the individuals who engage right. in it good i'm so glad because what i see highlighted right there psychological abusers we've been talking about psychological abuse that is what this show is this radicalization is psychological abuse and the woman we're going to interview is going to be talking about the psychological abuse that was directed at her father and how that affected her family. And, and, and again, this is a woman who's heard from now thousands of people who said, me too. Well, there you go. Let's move on to why it matters. Why does it why does it matter? Why high fidelity? First story this week. We're going to talk about Meta's Moldovan malevolence. And this story comes to us from PBS NewsHour. PBS NewsHour brings us the fact that Facebook ran ads in Moldova for an oligarch that is already sanctioned by the United States of America. His name is Il... Elon Shore, I'm sure I butchered that. I apologize. Uh, but he ran targeted ads on Facebook, uh, which directed the anger of the crowd at the then government of Moldova, which is a pro-NATO, pro-Western ties uh, government, and caused it to collapse. And Meta played a part of that. And I'm sure they'll pay, you know, a few million dollars in fines, maybe, because continuously nothing, <laughs> nothing is done about Facebook and Meta and how they're abusing their power and manipulating people uh, well, towards it's radicalization. Like, it's like watching this over and over and over again. We had, um, we just had uh, Zarina Zabriskie on, and Zarina actually documented a Potemkin protest of Moldovan babushkas who were paid to show up and protest against their pro-Western government. And it was all faked. It was just completely a hollow faked thing, probably 10 bucks a day for people to show up. They knew not to say anything because they didn't know even really why they were there. But I'm sure that that probably ran on Facebook. My God, it's the same stuff. Well, like I mean, Facebook wouldn't have gotten anywhere if it wasn't for a bunch of Russian money. Not only Russian uh, investment money, but the, all the 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 reason why Facebook got so enormous and you know in the in the mid teens was because um, all this fucking Kremlin psyops were going on and it was generating a huge amount of traffic and a huge amount of pe of attraction to the platform because people wanted to be angry, people wanted to be Bernie Bros, people wanted to you know fight. And that was intentionally, you know, allowed to happen with, you know, being coordinated by the fucking Kremlin and people in the United States who are helping them. It was right in the open. So all this, I mean, this is a this is a good story. It's a good example, a very tiny, teeny, teeny, yeah. weeny example. Because fucking Meta would not be Meta. It would be a, a little web a website. Uh, 
if it weren't for a whole bunch of uh, Russian money and ideology. It wouldn't be meta, it would be pokey. <laughs> Metavich. Hello, we are Metavich. <laughs> Good one, high five. All right, next story this week. We're going to talk about uh, the internet continues to try to kill you. How great. I know, this, right? Is, this one comes it, to us. Up, is this the uplifting portion of the... Yes, this, this is the inspirational. Uh, this one comes <laughs> to us directly from the Supreme Court of the United States. In the case of Reynaldo Gonzalez and all versus Google LLC, uh, this case has to do with the uh, parents of, <clears throat> of a young American girl who was uh, killed in the mass shootings in Paris. Mm. Uh and the reason Google is being sought out here, uh, particularly YouTube, uh, was due to the fact that YouTube actually had algorithms that pushed ISIS propaganda videos. Um, oh, wow. So, you know, Google's response is that Section 230 uh, protects the publishers of other people's content. And the argument here is that by utilizing the algorithm to promote, uh, you are not, in fact, a publisher anymore. You are a promoter. And as such, Section 230 no longer applies to you. Uh, this will have very interesting and drastic changes uh, to the Internet. And we'll see what happens. That's why it matters. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to because, you know, the Supreme Court is going to think to itself, what is the most damaging possible decision we can make here? <laughs> well, that, that's it exactly right. It doesn't really matter what they choose to do, because no matter what they choose, it's going to be beneficial to the wrong people, and they're going to screw yeah. it up. So, I mean, gonna... that's, that's it's just uh, trying to speculate, you know, the Russian nesting doll of okay, well, if I'm a crypto fascist, uh, you know, do I want this law or not, right? Um, and that's what they're going to, that, that, that's what they will do. Well, they will refer to their coat cadre handlers for, you know, the worst. Yes, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure the American legislative exchange council will come up with something. Um, <laughs> here, here's the problem. Uh, Alec, uh, that would be a, the legislative oh, arm oh, of, yeah, yeah. of the CNP. Yeah. yeah. He, actually, uh, he actually knows what the acronyms stand for. Yeah, I know Alec, but yeah, okay. Thank you. Sorry. I, you, <laughs> Sorry. You learned you're nothing every day. You're apologizing for your network. They got my attention. They really don't want it. Anyway, um, but here's the problem is, you know, for a long time now, the country's needed a federal anti-slap law. Uh, the country needs laws regulating social media. Um, and we need to recognize that social media is a battleground in cognitive warfare along with you know, fake news sites that are set up and uh, all the other manipulations. I mean, this is, uh, you know, it is undue influence through digital means. And that actually brings us to our third story. I don't even know what to call this one because it is so massive. Uh, this goes back to Carol Cadwallader's story, uh, but this oh. is investigating the Israeli agents of chaos Again, this is just one small part of this network. However, when you connect it to all of the pieces in the network, uh, it paints a much larger, much scarier, much more awful uh, picture. Because these gentlemen right here, Tal and Zohar Hanan, otherwise known as Team Jorge, they have been... Well, they've been tied to NSO Group. They've been tied to, uh, apparently you know, illegal black hat hacking, leaks, hacking and leaks, uh, public relations campaigns used to manipulate uh, presidential elections in multiple countries. And, uh, you know, Israel is allowing NSO Pegasus to still be sold. Um, they are under sanctions here in the United States. But there are so many articles that come out of this one story. Uh, they're Cambridge Analytica's black ops team. Uh, hacking, extortion, and election interference. Uh, you know, Jim and I, again, we were talking about the information security uh, community uh, here in the U.S. And, and globally and how they are being utilized. This one is just bizarre. They had to get a hashtag trending. 
about how this uh, this pet emu who had a large social media following had died, and it was uh, they were able to do it. That should terrify people. Oh and of course, uh, I know Emmanuel. I love that emu. Yeah, well, everything's a psyop, right? Oh. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, this is just the beginning because it's not just Israel. I would remind people of uh, Project Raven in the UAE that was, uh, you know, American information security professionals targeting other Americans for a foreign government. Um, there is a history of this. WikiLeaks, uh, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden. Mm -hmm. Uh, this story is massive. It's a large part of the network, and it's kind of difficult to wrap your brain around. But once you do, you'll see just how all these things have been weaponized, and that's why so, it matters. Let, let me ask a question. What is the good that can come out of the knowledge of these ops? Because this is massive. But well, is there something, Jim? Yeah, there's a So one story that was in there that was really important uh, that I saw is um, so Psy Group, right, was a Joel Zamel, Zamel the PsyOps company yeah. um, that specialized in social media characters to influence elections. And fucking Joel Zamel, Zamel was ex Mossad, and so were all of his people. Um, and they met with Donald Trump Jr., Mike Flynn, Steve Bannon, yeah. Eric Prince. In the White House, in not the White House, in the Trump Tower, mm -hmm. um, in the summer before uh, the election, mm -hmm. and George Nader paid uh, Joel Zemel two million dollars uh, for something. And George Nader is a pedophile who was a Saudi agent who who's was, currently uh, in prison. Mm -hmm. Currently in prison for uh, you know being a pedophile, and um, uh, so anyway, one of the stories is about how side groups alive and well just rebranded itself okay. uh, to, to something else. And um, side group actually, you know, is, uh, will be, have a honorable mention in my, uh, in my hellscape. All right. I think that it might just be time for hellscape. Jim Stewartson's hellscape. Oh fuck. Today I want to talk about controlled opposition. Um, controlled opposition, uh, in many ways is far more dangerous than direct opposition. Um, and, uh, it can be, uh, very challenging to figure out. Um, but it is really, really important to understand that it's real, uh, that it happens all day long. The basic idea of um, controlled opposition versus direct opposition is if you have direct opposition, what does that do? That makes your team come together, right? Now you have a common enemy and you're, you know, you're all fighting together against the, the bad guys, right? Um, in some ways that that's good for a movement because it shows you what you're against, right? In controlled opposition, they're on your side. They are pretending to be advancing the agenda of your movement when they're actually there to advance the agenda of your enemy. And what did uh, Vladimir Lenin say in the, in the Bolshevik re Revolution? He said, what is the best way to control the opposition? to lead the opposition yourself. I was fucking Vladimir Lenin a hundred years ago. This is not a new idea. It is not a crazy idea. It's there and it happens all the time. So who are some of the people that, you know, we've seen who have kind of outed themselves, right? Who were the secret version of controlled opposition until they just started going on Tucker Carlson, right? Tulsi Gabbard and Glenn Greenwald and Matt Taibbi and all these fucking, you know, Votniks um, who used to pretend to be kind of mainstreamish left, if far left kind of voices, right? Turns out they were just full of shit the entire time. 
They were controlled opposition. They were operatives there to collect intelligence, to smear and defame people, and to make the movement itself look ridiculous and stupid, right? Why was Marianne Williamson on stage at the, you know, uh, to debate or Tulsa Gabbard, Gabbard? They were there to make Democratic Party look ridiculous. That that was intentional. That's why as soon as that was over, Tulsi fucking Gabbard just started going on Tucker Carlson, got a rumble show, and is just doing straight up, you know, cult propaganda now. Right? She she was always there. So what what's important about this? What's important about this is the people who have made that kind of flip to just go on Tucker Carlson, that's rare. That's rare. Because those people have built enough of uh, following in an audience that they're able to kind of pull them back around to the other side, which is ultimately the goal, is to pull them back to where you actually want, right? But the vast majority of these people are still sort of in their hidey holes. And you see them, they, they, they're the ones who minimize everything, who, um, you know, uh, try and call you crazy if you, you know, start thinking about foreign interference uh, and things like that. Um, it, it's just whenever you see these stories, right, in the newspaper, where all of a sudden, you know, uh, the FBI thinks that there is no uh, uh, Russian connections to Donald Trump, that's controlled opposition in the fucking press, right? That was intentional. Um, so I bring this up, it's very important for people to understand um, that this is going on all the time. For me personally, right, um, my mission when I started this two and a half years ago was to dismantle QAnon because it was using shit that I invented to hurt people. Something we made for fun to, to tell stories, to have people excited and enjoy a, a new world. We're being inflicted on people. It fucking pissed me off. So I went and I actually wanted to find out who's behind it, how does it work, and how do we stop it. Turns out, the first people that I talked to when I started this journey were the people who claimed to be researchers on the subject, journalists who wrote about it, right? I made the assumption that those people were on my team, that they wanted to find out about QAnon, they wanted to stop it. Turns out not at all. I walked right into their trap, right off the bat, went right to the exact people who wanted me to think that they were Q experts and researchers, who as soon as I told them what I had found out, relatively easily, that the Russians were involved, that Mike Flynn was involved, all of a sudden, boy howdy. Two and a half fucking years later, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of defamatory tweets, and Jesus Christ, I mean, I cannot begin to tell you the amount of, of lies and bullshit that has been sent my way. The reason for that is because they do not want you to know the truth. And I am fucking here to tell you the truth, whether they like it or not. And again, the reason they're doing it, and the reason it's so pernicious and why it hurts, is because it's coming from behind, right? I walked into this trap thinking all these QAnon experts and researchers and journalists are going to be, you know, interested. All they were interested in was shutting me up. So I, I, I wanted to, to talk about this a, a little bit today because, you know, as expected, uh, the hate machine is revving back up on Twitter, right? Um, ton, all of them, every every one of these controlled opposition um, 
you know, bad actors is on my ass again. And I'll tell you what, it's glorious. Bring it. Because all you are doing is proving everything I am saying right now. Because all I have done on Twitter for five fucking weeks is go after Mike Flynn, go after bad actors, go after the big boys. And what are you doing? What are you spending your fucking time on? Going after me? That's your highest priority, right? Why is that? Because you're controlled opposition to QAnon. You don't want people to know the truth. And I don't care. I am going to tell people the truth. Arrest Mike Flynn. Yeah, so you guys just uh, figured out uh, why I created this show. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, the show is created around the investigative work of Jim Stewartson and the incredible news, uh, you know, networking intelligence, a high fidelity. And wow, that was a perfect example. If uh, people are going after Jim rather than going after those who are perpetuating these harms against humanity, then they really do tell on themselves. Uh, speaking of which, we have somebody who really um, has dedicated much of her career to going after the high level perpetuators of disinformation and radicalization. We are going to be introducing you to Jen Sanko. She's an award-winning documentary filmmaker and truth and media activist based out of New York City. And her documentaries all focus on socio-political themes. But I, I think probably for me, the most important thing that has been done about the times in which we live when it comes to the news radicalization is the brainwashing of my dad, Jen Sanko's film about her father losing his goddamn mind to Fox and Rush Limbaugh. Let's go ahead and see that trailer and then we'll bring Jen in. In the 1960s, Jen Senko's dad never had a bad word to say about any race or people or person. In the 80s, after my dad discovered talk radio during a long commute to work, he suddenly didn't like black people, poor people, gay people, feminists, Hispanics, and especially Democrats. After he discovered Fox News, they became the enemy. What happened to dad? The great story here for anybody willing to find it and write about it and explain it is this vast right-wing conspiracy, but it has not yet been fully revealed to the American public. By the 70s and the 80s, the media had been taken over by the extreme right. Homosexual marriage is, is such a threat to, to civilization itself. Fox News came along. Mass murder committed by immigrants. God no, controls the climate. Come on! In asking the question, what happened to her dad, it was really like asking what happened to our media. And in asking what happened to our media, it was really like asking what happened to our country. This is just our week of celebrating uh, women filmmakers. We are so happy to meet you, Jen Sanko. Um, as I told you uh, when we first chatted, it took me seven years uh, to watch your film because it was so personal to me. Uh, the Brainwashing of My Dad, of course, is the name of the film. You guys just saw the trailer. But it was such a personal story for me that it wasn't until I met Jen and she told me it has a happy ending. And I guess I can say that after seven years, you know, like we can let the cat out of the bag that I was able to finally watch it. And, and Jen, I cried my eyes out through the entire thing. And I'm sure I'm not the first person who told you that. What, um, what have been some of the responses to this film? Men have been known to cry. Gr uh, grown men have been known to cry. <laughs> I really, I had, I had men tell me that they, they, hold their eyes out at the end. Um, but really, the main response that I get from the film is people being thankful to me for telling their story. Yeah. Um, 
they, in the beginning, they really, so many people thought that they were alone and this horrible, weird thing was happening to them and their family. You know, I liken it to like the invasion of the body snatchers and pod people. You know, your your person that you love is there and then, you know, and sometime later they're not. They're completely different. And you're like, who are they? Who's this person that embodied me? So they, they're many people are grateful and and they're grateful that you're not alone the film explains why it happened which nobody does right and how it happened and then how we can help ourselves so i never like to make a documentary without you know some like this um, hopeful yeah at the end i i've seen I had a documentary club and we saw like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of documentaries and I was tired of all these endings like, okay, that's really bad, but you know, what the fuck? Right. What are we going to do? Can you tell me, you know, what's your opinion? Since you studied how bad this was, can you at least give me a clue as to what we can do to make it better? So I tried to do that. And of course that was, you know, back in 2016 now, there's a lot more things that we can do in that are being done, which is great. But yeah. the main reasons that uh, people, those are the main things that people, you know, reach out to me about. So I want people obviously to watch her film. I want people obviously to buy her book, which documents the making of the film and all the things that she learned and experienced through the process. But I mean, we're going to talk a lot about some of the, really breaking news still seven years later that occur in this film. But I think it's very important for people to know that her mother who stuck by her father when his brain had been seized by Fox and Rush's uh, addiction to outrage, um, her mother ran an operation that shut those narratives down where she turned the channel. And that is going to be a theme of this episode, the changing of the channel she turned the channel. The radio that he used to listen to Rush uh, was broken and she made sure it wasn't fixed. And I think one of the most critical things that I want to explore with you is those emails, the propaganda right-wing emails that was flooding his inbox anonymously in that 2012, 2011 period. I was getting the same emails forwarded from my father and I've been studying the origins of that your mother went into his computer and unsubscribed him and then subscribed him to, uh, you know, pro-democracy emails and your father changed and your father came back. Yeah. And that is the most beautiful thing that there's something that each and every one of us can do to bring family members back. Yeah. And um, it just, it just shows how powerful media can be. And sure, not everybody is susceptible. My mother was always, um, you know, um, suspicious, uh, always questioning, well, where are you really going, Jennifer? You know, you know, my father was always gullible, believed things. He grew up very, very naive um, in the Depression. And sure, he was smart. He, he got his master's degree and he could become an engineer, but he wasn't emotionally smart like my mother. Um, so, um, you know, he was, you can be very susceptible to all that. And the emails, the emails, when I read David Brock's book, I forget which one now, but he was, he was the one who first kind of like, after I saw the hunting of the president, like, holy shit, this, this was an actual, a conspiracy, like a real, a real conspiracy. And he was admitting to it. He was one of them. But he talked wow. about all these guys like sitting in, um, you know, a think tank room, a room in a think tank, coming up with these emails that sounded homespun and yeah. like it could be your next door neighbor, you know, or um, or maybe some local official that just the purpose of them constantly was bash Democrats, yes. bash Democrats bash democrats i couldn't believe it when i read that liberals had a war on christmas i yes. was like what because i lived in new york and i hung out with all these liberals 
we loved Christmas. Christmas is really big in New York. There's trees, everybody decorates, even the diners. And 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 I just was like, wow, this is a campaign. So yes. the emails were very dangerous. And my father not only got inundated by those emails, he inundated us with those emails. Me too. This is a me too moment. Yes, go ahead, Hi-Fi. So it's it's interesting you use the word campaign uh, because to me, and I'm a big picture kind of guy, when you say it's a conspiracy, when you use the word campaign, to me this says this is a slow-moving, long-term cognitive war. Bingo. And, and people's coup. brains. And coup. It's a slow-moving coup. Slow Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And we are going to talk about Fox. Uh, uh, Jen and I became friends because I sent her the Confessions of a Fox Blonde article that I wrote, which really was uh, terrifying for me. Uh, everyone who knows me knows I'm scared of everything, but I'm more afraid of not writing. I'm more afraid of not speaking out. So even though I'm scared of everything, I still just go Great. for it. Um, but uh, it was very great because when I did send it to you, I was terrified of what your response might be. And it was so loving and so kind and so non-judgmental, which is my happy place. Um, yeah. but, but more than anything, I look back now yeah. and part of the trauma for me in watching your film, which was very important for me to do, was that during the time my dad was getting those emails and forwarding them to me, and during that period of time, even though I didn't have a television, I was on Fox 11 as an anchor in Los Angeles. I didn't watch TV, but I was around televisions all day long and would see the five and could see the seduction of this sort of you know, weaponization of irony and all of that crap, and I felt responsible for my dad's radicalization. My dad was a bleeding heart liberal. And I realized, and especially talking to Jen, I know I'm not responsible. I resigned from Fox a decade ago, but my dad's friends were conservatives and were working on him and were the origins of where those emails were coming from. And then his daughter, is on a local Fox affiliate, which he, you know, was sending to his friends. And all of that ultimately led to, you know, once I got out of that cult and I became, went back to my roots and a lot of it's through my daughter's social justice activism and all of that stuff and became a pro-democracy truth activist with my skill set as an investigative reporter. My father mistook me for some form of the Antichrist because of how he had been brainwashed. And so sadly, toward you know the last year of his life, we were pretty much estranged. He thought me going to the Women's March was vulgar. And that was an example of the brainwashing of my dad. That's really I'm, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't use the word feminazi, to be honest. He didn't listen to Rush Limbaugh. He was getting it from the emails and from his friends who were Fox watchers. That was a Rush Limbaugh exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard that quite a few places. So maybe it just disseminated from yeah. Rush. Oh, yeah. I mean, but I mean, he's, yeah, disseminated from him. Yeah. Well, the campaign against the Women's March was that it was just a bunch of castrators and baby snatchers. And so that's who that's who he thought I was marching with. And I remember hanging up the phone on him when I heard it's the most vulgar display of and I hung up the phone and, you know, maybe a maybe a half a year earlier, I was literally begging him to vote for Hillary Clinton. I was on the phone with him for an hour and I was really trying to penetrate because I had produced stories about Trump and all the Ponzi schemes he was affiliated with. I knew him to be a con man. I, I you know, I learned about all the Russia ties, yeah. I'll put all that together a few months later, but I was just trying to get my dad to understand it. But, you know, I think that people who may have had a 
uh, a hard time with strong women. Maybe they grew up during the raging patriarchy. They were just vulnerable to all this stuff. And you mentioned it early on. Your dad was smart. My dad was so smart. Right. So it has nothing to do with intelligence. It's penetrating vulnerabilities. And I hate the way people dismiss them for that reason. Oh, they're all stupid. I think that's stupid to think that way because then you don't really get at the root of the problem. You know, you can't you can't really address anything if you just cut it cut it off like that. Absolutely. And so so let's talk a little bit about Fox. Hmm. The reason I was so happy and eager to have you on this week is there's been some breaking news thanks to, to the Dominion uh, you know, voting systems lawsuit uh, against Fox, and they have exposed uh, text messages. They've exposed Rupert uh, Murdoch messages. They've exposed that their top henchmen knew that the big lie was a lie, and yet uh, they continue to uh, stir up that outrage. And knowing all the harms that have been done to the minds of vulnerable people in this country and knowing that they cynically know that what they're putting out is a lie. What kind of ran through your head this week? What ran through my head was it's a shame that people who watch Fox aren't going to get this news. They're going to get, if anything, the reassurance from the liar that they're not lying. Um, because boy, I mean, I, I'm going to be posting this on, I have a Facebook page just for brainwashing, brainwashing of my dad. And I have, um, Republicans that come on and, you know, yell at me. So I say, sometimes I talk to them. So I'm going to see if I can find a video from YouTube that I can post on there where they show what Tucker Carlson is saying. And then what he said in, in an email, you know, what Sean Hannity said, and then what he said in an email, and how the two contradict each other, and how they can lie straight faced. They, they, that's one of the tactics is lying. And they're actors in, in some ways. I mean, they're not great actors when they pretend to be angry. To me, you can see right through them that thing. Of course. You know, if 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 a Republican that watches Fox could see that, that might things might begin to shift a little. It may be. I mean, it, it would be uncomfortable, but it might be paused for them. Like, look, just look at their face. They're acting like they always act. They're acting. So, what else are they lying about? Oh, that's so perfect. This is a perfect place for us to show a clip from the brainwashing of my dad. Check it out. I had a Kickstarter campaign to raise some money. And before I knew it, people were coming out of the woodwork, contacting me from all over the country, telling me similar stories. And I thought, wow, this is a real phenomenon. They just drummed into her what they wanted her to hear. She's a completely different person. My brother became very fact resistant. My reaction was, who are you and what have you done with my stepfather? Disjointed existence. And he was completely changed. He was he was bitter and angry. At one point, he threatened yeah. to get a bus. It was he became uh, challenging. obsessed. And she had never been like he that. He was carrying a small pistol. She was not hateful. And shot twice. It broke my heart to see my parents. He's very loving and caring. I feel I don't really know these people um, anymore. I mean, I want my just goes up nice to tyrants. Fundamentally senseless. I spoke with each one and found we all had one thing in common. Someone close to us became enraged and unreachable after excessively listening to or watching right-wing media. How did this happen? The great story here for anybody willing to find it and write about it and explain it is this vast right-wing conspiracy. Yeah, if that does not make our viewers want to see the entire documentary, you know, it's just, uh, again, you know, between the storytelling, the animation, the warmth of your family and all of the experts globally that you interviewed, um, it's just a really, really important document. 
of the uh, radicalization of our American citizens. And one thing that I think is so important about your film, among the many things that I think is so important, you show how in 1993, 70 GOP politicians lobbied to get Rush Limbaugh played on military bases. That is something that I didn't know. And that yeah. is something that I'm going to be exposing as often as I can. What the hell? All led by Robert Dornan, who was kind of a kooky guy, but he had this thing for Rush Limbaugh. I mean, like a lot of older men did. And he actually, you know, attacked somebody on on, on the, the floor of the House of Representatives. And he was he was kind of nutty, but he was persuasive and he persuaded 70 of his other colleagues to join him in demanding. And see, this shows to me how the Democrats got snowplowed, if that's a word. Um, it they, is now. It is now. And <laughs> they they um, they get bullied into playing, playing this stuff. They got bullied into playing Rush Limbaugh because these Republicans are like, big crybabies that are scary, <laughs> like a scary big crybaby. And they demand and they act like they're so offended and they come up with every excuse in the book. You're, you know, this is, you're uh, an enemy to free speech and you're against conservatives, you know, they play the victim. And, they, and you know, that to me, that's why Fox is still, on military bases today. Like, hello, it, it absolutely shouldn't be. Absolutely. I know, Hi-Fi, we talk a lot about radicalization within our military. And yeah. I would think that some of the origins can be found, you know, right in your film. Hi-Fi. Uh, so, you know, I, I want to go back to the war analogy because it, it really does feel like war. And Obviously, one of the greatest examples of the use of propaganda to turn a nation genocidal would be Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. One could also argue that uh, in Rwanda with the Hutus and the Tutsis, mm -hmm. right? And now we have Putin uh, carrying out genocide, right? Uh, he's carrying out a Lebensborn program where he's stealing children from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Um do you think that American journalists should be worried about charges at The Hague as they are supporting the Russian genocide? If not openly, they're at least undermining support for Ukraine. Well, leading to first of all, before you answer, air quotes on journalists. Because if you're a journalist who's supporting... Putin's war crimes. I need to put some air quotes around that. Well, if, if you're supported by Putin, you're on the wrong goddamn side. Of course. Right? Yes. Oh, okay. So you are referring to journalists who support Putin. We're talking about the actors essentially that, that you were referencing the bad actors, those yes. who, are, those who are out, you know, spewing Kremlin propaganda. Yeah. Right. Undermining democracy, undermining Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah, essentially they're whores, no offense to sexual whores. They're just, they're, yeah, they're, they're whores. They're yeah, whores. yes, yes, yes. And also, uh, can... Is that criminal, though? So that, 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 is it criminal? So so we are hoping that we will see tribunals. We, will, we are hoping that we will see some of these bad actors at The Hague. It That's should kind be. Of, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, journalists really... Um, this is another thing that David Brock talked about is um, the, the role of journalism used to be objectivity where your job was to discern the, the truth and, and um, not be fair and balanced or, you know, show both sides, uh, but to discern the truth. And so there should be consequences. I, I don't know. There's just not enough emphasis on truth. All the emphasis is on free speech, and I understand that, uh, but truth deserves to be heard. 
And truth, there is a war on truth, just like there's a war on kindness and empathy. The war is on truth. And, yeah. you know, we talked earlier about how Hi-Fi, you know, often has fought fire with fire. He's often used the techniques that these outrage, uh, you know, these these uh, people behind the outrage factories and the and those who are creating outrage junkies in America. He has used many of these tactics to psychologically fight back. And what do you think about um, what do you think about that in the kind of the framework of war? You know, I think like we all want to be good people and we all want to do the right thing. But when you're at war, all bets are off. You, if they're fighting with fire, you have to use more powerful fire. fire. And they declared war on us like 40 years ago. And so I'm happy when somebody, and thankful to somebody like Hi-Fi who can do stuff like that. Because why we're not um, putting ourselves on a cross. We're not like doormats. We, we, we can't let ourselves be walked. We have to fight back. Yeah. And yeah. They, by any means necessary. Thank well, it just, that. thank you. And it comes down to the fact that, you know, when I was a young man, I was bullied a little bit and I realized the bullies stop once you punch them in the nose. <laughs> just seems to be the way it works. Yeah. People always ask you, you know, what, what do you regret the most? And I think I only have one regret. And that was when I was bullied a lot because I was different as most you know, people who are different or bullied was when um, Louise Brand smashed a tuna salad sandwich in my face <laughs> instead of turning the other cheek like a good Catholic. I should have punched her in the face. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's I'm interesting saying. how how we all have bullying stories. You know, I was um, I'm a German American. My parents are German immigrants, so I was called Nazi my whole youth, and I am not a Nazi. Uh, you know, Hi-Fi just shared some bullying story. Jim Stewartson, uh, our other co-host, was bullied relentlessly as a kid, and so I think there's a we all kind of have a sense of um, we don't like injustice because it is that whole thing. You know, injustice anywhere is not you know, good for any of us. And so I feel like a sense of civic duty to do this kind of work. And uh, I know not everybody can, but it is something that we really believe in. And what I believe are failing right now is I, I in 2017, I knew I'd be voting for Biden. I knew he was exactly who and what we needed to help repair the soul of our country after the assault it had just been through. Um, but, but what, what we, and he's brilliant, he's doing incredible work, but what I need from our leadership today is an acknowledgement that we are a target nation of cognitive warfare, that it's coming from within and it's coming from without, it's coming from foreign enemies out of our country. And it's also coming from within our country. And, and if he does that, it will, it will open up room and money and support for how we fight back and how we address it. Other countries have done this where the government has teamed up with tech and with media in order to educate, you know, the population on what's going on. But instead, we are just looking around at the invasion of the body snatchers, wondering where all these good people went. All these good people, many of whom voted for Bill Clinton, many of whom cherished Jimmy Carter, who we talked about earlier, a good and a decent man who was actually a wonderful president. And we allowed this cancer uh, to metastasize this, this, you know, greed is good, you know, get, get rid of all the guardrails for capitalism, you know, regulations bad. We got a bunch of poor people in America to give a shit about rich people's taxes. You know, there's been a you know, a, a very directed right-wing think tank, Coke Cadre, Mercer Money effort to screw with the heads of Americans so they vote against their own best interest. 
And they're also radicalizing people with digital poison en masse. And I am begging every week for our leaders to stand up and acknowledge the war. And I believe that Fox needs to go the way of RT. We need to get rid of it. It's bad. It's dangerous. I hope that we could do that. I mean, you know, there is that group Truth Tuesdays that stands out there every Tuesday in front of Fox. and Our and friends, Holly and Milo. Julie. Um, I just suddenly felt like I was in that kindergarten show. I see Julie and I see Holly. <laughs> yes, yeah, I know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, um, I, I didn't think Biden had it in him, but he... At the on the State of the Union address, actually, he actually addressed that. Like, hey, what we've been doing since Reagan, he didn't say Reagan, but you know, the last few decades isn't working, which is you know essentially this trickle down um, voodoo economic. Um, balls to the wall idea that you get rid of deregulation, you get the money float to the top and it will trickle down. He, he actually addressed that. That was, that was astounding. And I, I have to say he was, he was quite masterful in that state of the union address. And Democrats have generally been afraid to say that. I mean, Hillary Clinton back in 96 uh, said there's a vast right wing conspiracy, but she got hammered on so much. I think I, I do think she was traumatized. I mean, I, I would have been traumatized. I'm traumatized just thinking what happened to her in the last seven years. We often say on this show that she is the first politician who we believe was virtually assassinated. So yeah. we what they did to her. Yeah. Uh, was a virtual assassination. And, and revisiting Carter, a lot of the same narratives were framed around him. Um, but yes, hi fi yeah. I have two things, actually. Um, <clears throat> the first one is, you know, we're talking about Jimmy Carter. And it's funny that we're talking about Jimmy Carter because uh, supposedly the man who was responsible for Iran holding the hostages so that Reagan won the election was a fellow named... Jack Singlob. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason we believe that to be true is that Jack Singlob then appears again shortly thereafter in the Iran Contra hearings. Uh, the Iran Contra hearings also gave us Oliver North. Oliver North was at the NRA as Maria Butina was shuffling Russian money through. Mm -hmm. So there's like this network of characters that you can spot in all mm -hmm. these bizarre political occurrences. So mm -hmm. that leads back to our conspiracy uh, that Hillary Clinton was talking about. And the second thing is, is that conspiracy also involved something that Reagan did, which was the elimination of the Fairness Act. And could you mm -hmm. tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Fairness Doctrine, um, actually, you know, FDR came up with because he saw, again, I mean, it's like he saw what was going on in Germany you know, Goebbels gave out all these, he didn't give them out, but he made radios really, really cheap. Yeah. But then, you know, had they were only allowed to listen to Nazi propaganda. Wow. There's all this happening before it really happened. And, and you know, Hitler was on the rise and journalists didn't take him seriously. But That's right. Take Trump seriously because he was kind of a buffoon, you know, with his big temper and blah, you know. Um, and um, so he, so you know, he wanted to make sure that radio in the United States uh, served the public, and you could only serve the public if you had a diversity of interests, um, and you didn't allow, um, you know, you, you made sure the ownership was was spread out, like. Um, you know, now it's all consolidated. Yeah. So um, it, 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 there was the equal time rule was, was, was different. That was like a different clause. Um, but still, none of this would have happened if uh, the first blow was Reagan 86 in the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, and that was partly encouraged by the Heritage Foundation, who had the right hand. Of, of Reagan, and you know they knew that they 
they wanted to bring America back to like the 1900s and get rid of regulation. So they knew that media was their, that was like their, that I'm, they, I'm, with, you that. said heritage foundation and I'm watching the network, uh, you know, that's that's coke machine, money, right? Machinery and hi fi's head. He's like heritage foundation. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah I mean, um, after the Lewis Powell memo, uh, all of these big giant corporations ch chipped in yeah. to create right wing think tanks. Yeah, um, and the Heritage Foundation was the first one, um, just created a year after the Lewis Powell memo. But um, so anyway, that was that was the the first blow. Um, getting rid of the fairness doctrine, um, basically saying you didn't have to be fair. Somebody could, one person could hog all the time. And a year later, Rush Limbaugh went national. Okay, we know, all know what happened there. But the, the, the final blow, the really big blow, blow hi fi, that was the Telecommunications Act. Bingo. That was the Telecommunications Act. It's like as if somebody's head was sort of like hanging off and then that just whoosh, chopped it. Because what it did was it opened up media and by then we had television. Um, and um, so you have, you could have like five or six corporations owning 1,500 stations, 2,000, um, uh, publishing companies. Yeah, uh, you know, you could you could enable Rupert Murdoch. Yes, to to create what yeah. ultimately is an evil empire. The reason or I wrote, Sinclair. The reason I, mean, that I wrote. Too. Yes, that's true too. That's that that's a very important one because mm -hmm. they actually uh, are doing all their brainwashing on the on the radio as well. But the reason I wrote Fox is a shithole country mm -hmm. is it, it literally just like as I was creating this because I had to respond in, in uh, I had to get it out of my system. Um, but because like, if we can, if we can look at them, you know, as this big kind of grotesque island, you know, maybe there's a way to then say, no, that shithole country. And I, and again, I'm not trying to disparage what that line was originally about. I'm literally just trying to focus on what Murdoch has created, the infection globally that it has, um, you know, uh, perpetuated. And I, I feel like if we can just cut it out like a cancer, at least we get rid of one of them. And, yeah. that's, and that's what, you know, Jim is always talking about. If we turned off Telegram, that would get rid of one of the radicalization channels. If we did something about Rumble, you know, France got rid of Rumble. Rumble's another platform, the Peter Thiel, J.D. Vance platform that basically still platforms RT, even though we, we excised it, we cut it out of our country. Uh, yeah. We got to start somewhere. You know, FDR had a, a huge pair. <laughs> because, yes. Um, I mean, they got rid of Tokyo Rose during the mm -hmm. war. How is Fox any less vile, yeah. anti-American, treasonous than Tokyo Rose? I'm so glad you said that. I'm so Amen, sister. That. Amen. I'm so glad you said that. I'm yeah. so glad you said that. The reason I'm I'm so excited is that I just quoted um, Justice John Paul Stevens, who was the one to dissent to he wrote the dissent in the Citizens United ruling. And he said the same thing. He said, what this is going to do is it's going to allow what Citizens United is going to do is it's going to allow uh, the, the narration of Tokyo Rose to be on equal footing and as loud as the Allied commanders during World War II. That is the crux of our problem right now. And we got to have big balls to deal with it. Let's just say it. We need, we need some big damn balls here. <laughs> I, I got I to say, and I, I know some on the left are, are going to pillory as well, because I understand the fear that you don't want government uh, controlling speech, right? Um, but... But when, when that allowance and allegiance to a doctrine such as free speech is the very thing that's taking down the freedom and democracy in America, there's something wrong. 
And you have to be able to, to tweak that somehow. There are other democratic countries that don't allow hate speech or anything like that. Yes, uh, preach. So, so, I mean... Why can't we do that? Yes, we have to attack the antitrust laws, and that would help a lot of it. But for God's sakes, Fox is tearing our country apart, and we're not going to do anything about it? At least get it out of the fucking military. I can say fuck, can I? Yes. Here? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Say it multiple times if you'd like, because I do. <laughs> fuck, fuck, I love that word. <laughs> But uh, so here's no, no, here's hold, hold on hold just 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 hold on that <laughs> is that is our soundbite that is our soundbite of many soundbites but that's our promo right there oh my god oh my god fuck 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 yes Germany has laws against hate speech because they learned what happened when you don't have laws against hate speech right. and also we had a Ukrainian soldier on a few weeks ago, who's also a filmmaker, who's really brilliant, Volodymyr Demchenko. And he said that our freedoms are continually being seen as a weakness and exploited by countries that have no freedom in order to destroy us. So, yes, right. big ideas, please. High five. High five. Big idea here. Um, you know, one of the things that Tucker Carlson has done and Fox News has done is they have embraced and repeated the great replacement theory. You know, and this is the theory that white people are being replaced by brown people, whatever. It's bullshit. But that specific ideology and that specific repetition, which is a propaganda technique, mm -hmm. has led to murders by white supremacists who have mm -hmm. specifically cited great supremacist theory. Mm -hmm. You know, they have, they have talked about how they were radicalized by media, how they were radicalized on the internet. And yet we keep treating these individuals as a one-off instead of what they are, which is systemic. Mm -hmm. And I feel there needs to be some liability for these television stations and these websites and these providers who who deal this deadly content to people how do how do we do that yeah um a couple of us um from this other little group dm group i have called speak up um we were talking to a lawyer you know about like suing over things like for instance fox lying about um covid um you know and, and downplaying it <sighs> And, you know, subsequently people, fathers, grandfathers, all, all kinds of people dying because they didn't either want to get vaccines or they didn't want to wear masks. They didn't believe they believed it was a hoax, whatever. It you really need. Again, we were talking about a pair. So we need a lawyer with a pair, somebody who's who's really brilliant to figure out how to do this. I mean, that seems viable to me, but I'm not a lawyer. You're going to make me go to law school, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That, was so, that was so perfect. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a couple things I want to bring up before we let you go. The, the time always goes so fast. One thing, tell our audience about your book. Explain kind of what uh, prompted you to also do a book about the experience, the brainwashing of your dad. Okay. Um, I'll try to make it short. I, I, I tend to take the scenic route. Um, <laughs> we all do. I, I kind of felt like, you know, my, I did my movie because I felt like I wanted to save the world. <laughs> and then I felt like, well, gosh, it's not getting the attention that I feel like it needs. It needs to really get out there. But I noticed like on all these news shows, they always had people who wrote books on. So I said, hmm, okay, I guess I'll write a book and that way I can do more research and update it. And I did more research, like I read Nancy McLean's yes. Democracy and Chains. I'm looking over there because that's where some of my books are. Yeah. Like, network, stuff like that. And 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 just as I was like maybe two years into writing the book, and I was I was in uh, Crete on vacation. That was so nice. I wish I could do that again. And I got an email um, from Sourcebooks, one of the largest 
I think it is the largest women's publishing company in America. And they said, hmm, have you ever considered another venue of publication for your book? I mean, for your movie? And it was a long way of saying, you know, we're interested in maybe writing a book. So I wrote back, well, funny you should say that. <laughs> I started a book. So um, that's how I got into it. And Fantastic. They, 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 they've been really great. Um, there's just one thing that I kind of was annoyed at. There were three instances in there when I was talking about um, history where I called it um, mini coup number one, mini coup number two, and mini coup number three. And I think that they saw that as two. I mean, it was before January 6th, obviously. You know, wow. That is too inflammatory. So. Oh, my God. No. Well, that I, I get that. High five. Well, it's, it's interesting that they said that, you know, talking about coups was too inflammatory because you were in Crete and Crete is one of the Greek islands. And if you are familiar with the Golden Dawn in Greece and how the Golden Dawn worked with police it directly parallels how the Proud Boys worked with police in the United States during their attempted coup. We call him our Google teddy bear. He's always pulling out all the factoids. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's parallel behaviors that you have to be able to see. Yeah. It's the same playbook run endlessly in different... The Yellow Vests, right? Yes, right. The Golden Dawn, the Proud yeah. Boys, the Three yeah. Percenters. Matter of yeah. fact, you even, you even had something in your movie that caught my eye talking about militias and a militia that identified with the 3% uh, movement. I Can did. you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I remember really small details. Sorry. It's, well, it's this thing I do. So quick, I, I, I want to let our viewers know one thing, um, and I don't know if I can say this. Can I say who actually optioned your film for the potential of being yeah. a musical? <gasps> Her film was optioned by Andrew Lloyd Webber, and I think that's so cool. I know that nothing's happened at this moment, but I still think that that's so brilliant that somebody as brilliant as that had the vision of how this could actually be set to music because, again, I told you I wrote my screenplay, Zombie Newsroom, which I've always seen as a musical, and yeah. it, it gives people hope that when you create the art and you put it out there, particularly in your case, for all the right reasons yeah. to show what happened to your father, which then allowed all of us who watched the same thing. You, you, you told the story of so many people. So it's, 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 it's very exciting for artists and filmmakers to actually see somebody who pursued it and went for it. And, and Matthew Modine, if you guys haven't seen the film, he narrated it and he does a beautiful job Excellent of job. it. Yeah. And again, just a kindness. Like that was just him saying this is an important film, right? Well, back to the Andrew Lloyd Webber thing for a moment. Now that I couldn't believe it when I got that email either. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really, I almost like put it in spam because I thought. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to make a musical out of the brain. I, 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 I just I, I have to admit, I do have a fear of like a fat Rush, Rush Limbaugh like character going, I am here to feed you propaganda or something like that. Because, yeah, that just. He's, yeah. he's a classically trained uh, singer, <laughs> cellist and opera singer and all that good stuff. So uh, Hi-Fi's got all kinds of tricks. Uh, so we only have like another minute or two left and. Oh, yeah, we went through a hell of a week, and I just would love you to summarize to people why seven years after making this film, it is even more relevant, I think, than, than even it was then. Like, there's maybe because of the inertia, maybe because nothing's been done. I think when, when someone is prescient, as I... I hope that doesn't sound like I'm bragging, but as I was, people can't really see it until they see it. Mm -hmm. And I think people have seen it mm -hmm. and they've seen it in a number of ways. They've seen it by seeing their rights being taken away. They've seen mm -hmm. their, their parents, loved ones, brothers, sisters, children, 
you know, turn like, you know, like the invasion of the body snatchers, the pod people, they've seen it in Trump. You know, now people wonder how Trump happened. This is how Trump happened. Bingo. And so I'm very delighted about what Dominion is doing. And I'm thinking, finally, this is fantastic. I hope yep. so, because as I wrote about in News of the World, you know, the, the phone hacks in the UK, Rupert and his brood ended up unscathed and a lot of people suffered because of that, and including Amy Winehouse, which I mentioned. But I hope you're right. Yes, Hi-Fi. Um, I, I love your film. And I think your film is important, important viewing for anyone who's wondering what the hell is going on in the world. Yeah. Um, there, there are two slight issues I have with it. And I think this is more of a time thing mm -hmm. as, as ops expose themselves, right? It becomes apparent that they are ops. Um, and, and the two that kind of threw me in your movie were Noam Chomsky, which Chomsky took me by surprise. I used to read Chomsky as a kid. Like mm -hmm. I loved Chomsky mm -hmm. and now he's turned into something that I don't even recognize. I know. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other one is WikiLeaks. And I think we can look at WikiLeaks' role in Pizzagate and Snowden and some other things and, and realize that. Yeah. It's just it was, time. You, you it's gotta, just time. You got to realize. I, I, yeah, I agree. Um, you got to realize, though, that this was like when WikiLeaks was just beginning. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a really good thing at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah, right. I know. Hindsight's 2020. We've learned a lot. But I also think that the takeaways from this film are that, you know, our families are being brainwashed en masse and not, you know, one man's opinion about, you know, WikiLeaks and journalism. So and, and, I think that's the bigger picture. And masses yeah. of people across the country are voting against not only their own interests, but the interests of like 85 percent of the rest of the country. Well, and yes. I would argue they're voting against the interests of our entire world that keeps us alive by Absolutely. allowing these petrol yeah. princes to choose our leaders. Yeah. So so one last thing I do want to say, because uh, you brought this up, Jen, when we were chatting uh, earlier. Uh, we just saw the image of Musk and Rupert Murdoch together. And this is very fresh in my mind because, again, your film exposes not only does Rush Limbaugh not believe his lie, which is something that your film exposed his lies. Rupert Murdoch clearly does not believe uh, the lies that, that his network perpetuates to millions and millions of Americans. Mm -hmm. I just wrote about Unmusk showing that he is literally actively harming truth and using a lot of the uh, principles of, you know, or lack of principles of uh, channelology or whatever in order to harm our world, we now see the two of them together. Yeah. What, yeah. What, 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 what does that say? Oh, did that Conspiracy. <laughs> Holy moly, that was... In what orbit? Oh, my God. Right. I think we're sounding a big alarm here that there's a lot more of us than there are of them. And these things may seem unsolvable, but they are not. So anyone in a position of leadership with a big set. Yeah. <laughs> you look for a big set out there. Okay. Like this big. Virtually or in reality. They could be metaphorical, you know, it can come from a women, women too. Era. Quite frankly, the women filmmakers that we've been celebrating, you and Melissa Jo Peltier, and I believe, you know, this show is a testament of these guys back, uh, the work that I do. I believe wherever it's going to come from, you know, non-binary, we don't care. Let's just, uh, let's make some big moves. Democrats used to make big moves. They right. can do this again. We can do it again. We can look to see what's working in other countries. But first, watch her film, read her book. Hi-Fi's got one last thing. I know he does. He always does. Well, no, it's just to kind of sum up our we need someone with a pair. Uh, yeah. I would remind President Biden that he did say nobody fucks with a Biden. Let's see if he really <laughs> means it. Uh, 
<laughs> hey, President Biden, if you're listening, we need your help. We want to bring our loved ones back. We want to bring our loved ones back. Yeah, that's our that's our show. Let's see one more clip from the brainwashing of my dad. And uh, and then we will, uh, you know, let everybody go. Branding is about creating an image that will stick in the mind. Whether that image created is accurate or not doesn't matter. Democrats, liberals, and progressives are branded as big government spenders, dishonest, America-hating elitists who are all atheists who hate Christmas and are soft on crime and weak on defense. They've branded the media as liberal, so much so that it's taken for granted that it's true. One um, catchphrase mm -hmm. that I, I hear over and over mm -hmm. again is liberal media. Mm -hmm. um, did you hear your dad? All the time. I heard him use the term liberal media all the time. He'd be like, oh, you can't listen to liberal media. As if there was no such thing as the conservative media. If you analyze news coverage, as FAIR has done, you find that the news tilts a little bit to the right. It's sort of center right. Republicans usually outnumber Democrats. It's just pure math. And then people say, well, why do so many people believe the liberal media myth? If you keep handing opinion shaping power to right wingers who don't have evidence to yell about, oh, liberals, the liberals, the liberals, the liberals who die, well, it's going to have some traction. The liberal media. Liberal media. Liberal bias. Liberal media, folks. Liberal press. It is the liberal media. 